Well, good morning, everyone. Great to be with all of you here um, in Yonkers. Um, as mentioned, my father is David Dunlap. Oh, there's an echo coming from this. Sir, way to mute this. Yeah. Let me do that. That works. Perfect. Okay. Um, yeah, my father is David Dunlap, who's been with you all a couple of times. Um, I used to come here growing up. Um, I think I came a couple of times as a teenager. Uh, always a good time. Always enjoyed being here. We would stay with the O'Connors at uh, Bethany House, and we would come up here. So maybe some of you remember meeting me then. I was probably 16, 17, 18, somewhere around those, those years that I came up here. But um, of course, it was when we would come here, we'd always go visit New York City. And I love New York City. It was always a good time. I love the city, uh, any city. Um, and I really wanted to be a New Yorker when I grew up. When I got a job after college, I wanted to move to New York City. But the Lord had other plans, and I had the opportunity to go to Detroit. Uh, and I became a Detroiter instead, <laughs> instead of a New Yorker. And I've been there just, a, it'll be six years this month. Yeah, six years this month since I moved to Detroit. You can see the owner, um, owner's a believer. My, my boss was his son, also a believer. And I worked for them for almost six years. Uh, as, as was mentioned, I did, yeah, worked mostly with Ford. I live Down the street from Ford World Headquarters and up the street from the Rouge plant where all the F-150s, my whole world, <laughs> everywhere I look, there's Fords, every chance. I worked for many different automotive companies at that agency, but Ford would became my primary client. I probably spent a solid three years working, working very, very closely with Ford Motor Company. Loved it. Loved trucks. I have a Ranger. Um, Love my Ford Ranger. Um, but it was a really cool job. And then, but then the Lord moved in my heart a little over a year ago, probably the end of 2019. And I just began to feel more and more like I was losing my enjoyment for that line of work. I loved it all six, all five and a half years I was there, but slowly the enjoyment was going. And he just put on my heart a desire to, to use my time more for his service. Um, and my father said, why don't you call Rob? <laughs> why don't you call Rob? And so I called, I, uh, I, I guess I reached out and you quickly responded and, and we moved quickly and he gave me the opportunity to come work with him at BSS. And I've been there five months now and really, really have enjoyed my time working with BSS, what the Lord has been able to do with that time. And so I look forward to hopefully much, much more time doing that and serving the Lord in that capacity. Um, uh, Rob is generous. I started rock climbing two weeks ago. Um, and when you, top rope certification is something most people accomplish in like their first two days, I actually failed the first time. So it took me four days, not two. Um, but I, I don't want to mislead. And anybody here who cl climbs would be like, that's not impressive. But some, I heard somebody go, wow. So that was that was a good feeling, but my, uh, my friend who's coaching me would have been like, man, he's behind. So, um, so anyway, just so you know, just so lest I deceive you and make you think I'm anything more special than I really am. <laughs> All right, I'm going to go ahead and share. I think I need to share the PowerPoint for uh, those on Zoom. Okay. Um, so enough about me. Let's get into the word here. Uh, go with me to, hold on, is, this is not changing. There it goes. Okay, there we go. Now you saw the whole thing already, so don't get ahead of me. All right, First Timothy chapter four. Let's turn there this morning. Book of First Timothy, chapter four. Um, and I, uh, um, I'm spending a lot of time meditating in the book of Timothy. Um, just the whole life of Timothy. Really, we're going through the Acts at my church right now. The Acts of the Apostles. We're taking on uh, the whole book and just going through and looking at how uh, the Lord worked through his in his early church. How he worked through the apostles and. Timothy, obviously, an interesting subject within those books. He shows up in the second half of the book, more or less. But of course, as we know, becomes a close companion of the Apostle Paul's. Um, and so just a lot of interesting things from his life. And, um, and I, wanted, I just wanted to prepare a message. I was down in Florida at my father's church a few weeks ago speaking to the young people in Florida. He has a conference there. And I was sharing some, some messages with them from Timothy. And I wanted to bring some of those thoughts to, to all of you here this morning. So 1 Timothy chapter 4, we're just going to look at five verses, verses 12 through 16 here. And they're just, um, there's, I, I don't know about you, but I'm somebody who likes to think about individual words, right? Uh, I, when I see a word or I see a grouping of words, just to take those out and just think about what those things mean. Um, now, when I do that, of course, I have to put it into context um, to think about what do those two words mean within the entire chapter or book or whatever the idea is. Is here, And so we'll be looking at some of that too, but we're going to focus on just some key words in these five verses. So because there's so many words, we're only going to do five verses, but there's some really important themes here I think Paul gives to Timothy. Just by way of context, we often, because Paul says to Timothy, don't let anyone despise your youth, we often think Timothy was quite young. That's not really the case. 
Um, Timothy, uh, I, from what I have studied, there's different, there's different ideas, but Timothy's probably in his 30s. But the idea is Timothy is young compared to many of the men who are in that, that meeting. Something that Timothy was a struggle for him, we know this from the book of Acts, is that his mother was Jewish. Anybody know his father was? Father was Greek, right? And that was so, so because of that, Paul, it even says Paul had him circumcised just to make sure there was nobody, he didn't cause any conflict with the Jews. So he was younger in terms of age. He was younger in terms, well, what they would have thought in terms of his knowledge of scripture because he had a Greek father. But what did, what did Timothy also have? He had a Jewish mother. And she's commended along with his grandmother. Somebody mentioned that earlier this morning. She is commended in the beginning of 2 Timothy for being very, very instrumental in his life. An important work. She taught him the scriptures. Something that's very, very apparent to me as I study the book of Acts and as you look in these, in these uh, places like 1 Timothy and throughout the epistles, um, they're studying, the, they're in the word. And the word they're in is the Old Testament. It's the law and the prophets, right? And even in there, they are seeing the Messiah. They are being taught. The, Timothy was taught the Messiah would be Christ, right? And he, so when Christ came, he believed that. His mother taught him to believe that. Timothy would have been alive. He probably would have been in his 20s, uh, teens and 20s when Christ was in his earthly ministry. And so his mother taught him to believe that that is the Messiah that's promised through the Old Testament scriptures. And so he was very, very fluent in them. Right. So many Jews may have looked down on him uh, for because he had a Greek father and because he was young, they would have thought perhaps he doesn't know what we know. Uh, but that's not the case. He had a mother and a grandmother who taught him the scriptures well. And this being Mother's Day, I just think it's, you know, it's worth it's well, it's worth thinking about that no matter what. But it also happens to be Mother's Day, um, just how important a role right parents play in the life of their children. Um, and how to be like Paul's mother to, to teach, teach, your, teach your children the scriptures, but teach them where the Messiah is throughout scripture. Christ is the Messiah. He came to fulfill the law, not to destroy it, not to upend it, not to bring punishment and sin in the world, but to fulfill the law and to offer us salvation. Uh, one of my favorite things Christ says is that I have come to do what? I have come to give life that you might have it what? More abundantly. That's, a, that's, that, that's two words to think on. Three words. Life more abundantly. That's what Christ offers you. Do you understand what that means? Do you accept that? Do you believe that? Do you live that way? Just to meditate on those three words, life more abundantly. That's what Christ wants you to have. That's what he came to offer you. Um, he says, uh, he said, uh, Paul says, to, I think it's in Timothy somewhere where he tells him to, to, to take hold of abundant life. Paul himself says in Philippians, I want to lay a hold of a life that is truly life, right? The idea that life as we think of it is not what is truly life. And Paul says, not that I've attained that, but I press on. I press on that I can lay hold of that and by any means conform to the image of Christ. Um, just wonderful thoughts there to think about. So, um, but Timothy was taught that idea by his mother and his grandmother. So I just want to point that out. Timothy also, just by way of context, before we get into the scriptures here, he is, if you will, the pastor, right? Not in the sense of, you know, the way some churches use it, but he is, he is the pastor in the, in, the, in the, you know, literal sense of the word that he is shepherding this flock. Paul has left him in charge. This is, he's at Ephesus at this point. By the way, Timothy served in at least six different churches. Um, I have it, and I have written down somewhere else. I don't have it right in front of me. But Timothy served as Paul's shepherd, uh, well, Christ's shepherd, I, I should say. But Paul appointed him as a shepherd of at least six different churches. At this point, he's at Ephesus as Paul's writing him this letter, um, and uh, he is the main person in charge here. It's it's his duty to help this church continue on in the things of the Lord. So when we come to verses twelve through sixteen, Paul is giving him very specific instructions on how to do that. By way of context, he starts, he starts off chapter four by saying, the spirit expressly says that in latter times, some will depart from the faith. They will give heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, right? They're going to be, he goes into more things. They're going to be deceived by all these things. They're going to be deceived by things that look like good works, right? He says, they're going to say forbidding to marry. That was some of the Corinthians were doing. Um, commanding to abstain from foods. That was something else that was happening in Corinth. Places where the church had gotten off track. These were things that were becoming prevalent but they were false teaching. He says they will depart from it because they will get out of the word, right? So Paul's going to say to Timothy in these last four verses here of chapter four, how do you help keep people from departing from the faith? Um, sometimes we think of it as a condemning thing, right? That these people are going to leave. But I think what Paul is really saying here is, Timothy, if you don't do these things, if you're not faithful in ministering well, people are going to leave and it's going to be sad. Um, they might not leave the church. They're going to depart from the faith and then the church will become corrupted which is even more sad. There's a body still meeting that's corrupted. It'd be better for that church to dissolve and not have them putting out that message. There's places all throughout scripture where God says, I would rather not hear your praise at all. You've become lukewarm to me. I don't desire you as worshipers, not in the way you currently are anyway. And so Paul says, keep that from happening. Here's what you do. So let's look at verses 12 and 16. Let no one despise your youth, 
but be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Till I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of the, hand, uh, laying on of the hands of the eldership. Meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them, that your progress may be evident to all. Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. Um, let's just go ahead, open a word of prayer, and just commit the, the, the Lord's word to his Holy Spirit and his leading. Dear Lord, we just thank you for your word here. Lord, teach us to recognize the power of your word, just how active it is, how in your name all things can be accomplished, Lord. And so just teach us to look at these words and receive them with the great importance that they carry and allow the spirit to use them to work in our hearts, work in our minds, and to impact the way we ultimately live our lives, Lord, that we may seek to glorify you in all that we do with these words. So Lord, we just put these things before you this morning. We lift up your name. We desire to see it, receive all the praise and glory that it's worthy of. And we ask these things in your name. Amen. All right. We're going to go through verse by verse, looking at some key words. The first thing I want to touch on here is the idea of not despising age. Paul, now Paul talking to somebody who is younger, he says to Timothy, don't let them despise your youth. But I want to think about here, age is neither a qualifier or a disqualifier for service. Sometimes we can say somebody is too young, they are too young, they are not mature enough yet. That could be there. There are certain levels of maturity required for service, right? We don't want to neglect that. But Paul says, Paul makes it clear to Timothy, your age is not a disqualifier. Age is also not a qualifier. There were other people in that church who are obviously much older than Timothy who were not qualified to be the leader. Paul is appointed by the, by, the, by the Spirit's conviction. He is appointed Timothy as the leader here. And so the idea here, I think that's important for us to look at here. Everyone is important in the work of the Lord. I, I really think it's extremely important that a church neither be mostly too young or mostly too old, but that we find that balance, that we desire to reach out to people of all age groups, um, to not want to see it just be a certain age. There's, a, there's, there's churches in Detroit uh, in the Midtown area where our big university is that uh, are mostly just young people. And part of that's just because that's the main demographic there. But you can see one of my friends is a pastor there and you can see the struggles they have. Many of them come from the fact that they're almost all under the age of 35 and they do good things there. But there are some struggles. And I think it's because they need more. They need to find more older people who are willing to serve in that assembly. Conversely, many of us have probably seen assembly or churches, assemblies that are predominantly older people. And they struggle because they don't have the energy and the passion and the mind of young people serving there. I think it's so important. We see in the book of Timothy, we see instructions for all age groups being involved, right? To older men, right? Minister to the younger one. Older women, minister to the younger. Young men, use your youth to serve. You know, use that energy uh, that is lacking in, in the older people who are in the church. Um, we, I think it's really important that we just think about that here, that one of the important things for this, healthy, for this church to continue to be healthy, one of the important things for it to continue to strive, Paul stresses to Timothy, is don't let anyone despise your age. And I think uh, for whatever age you are at, you know, think about that. Um, I can serve. I can still serve. You may have to reduce capacity because of certain limitations that are coming with age. You may be able to increase capacity because of certain things that are coming on as you grow older. But don't think of your age as a hindrance, as a restriction. But I also want to say I think service based on age should be um, very much a decision of the body, right? It should, the body should look and say, what do we need from this person? What is their gifting? Where can they be valuable? Most importantly, what is their maturity? Is this person mature? There are some people who have, who have uh, many years of age, but very little maturity. There are some people who have very few years of age, but tremendous maturity, which was the case with Timothy here. And so I think it's important for the church to look at those things. Some people demand more than they should have, and elders don't step up and say no. Some people cling on to something that perhaps they should begin to step back and bring other people into. I think it's important that the body is making the decisions here. But don't let anyone disqualify you because of your age. Age is both an advantage and a disadvantage. I think all of us can attest to this, right? Youth, bring, youth brings energy. There's an excitement. There's an exuberance. Uh, there is physical energy in service there. But all of that needs to be managed through the wisdom of people who have been alive much longer, right? And have grown in maturity and can see these different things. Age brings that experience. Um, if you had a, if you had a sports team, right. Full of guys who were incredibly talented, very young, had lots of energy. They could do, say, say it's a basketball team. You have 12 guys who are very fast. They're very athletic. They can dunk, they can shoot, but they have no coach to give them a game plan. Will it be a successful team? No. Right. That, there's tons of great basketball players out there. 
only a few of them actually make it into the NBA because only a few of them are able to submit to an authority <laughs> to be able to fit into a coaching system. Some of them are good enough for one system, but got not good enough for another system. It requires a coach with wisdom, experience, maturity, someone who has played the game, someone who has understands the game, has spent years studying it to take all that youth energy and talent and to make it something that can do great things, right? So it's really important we consider these things. So Paul says to Timothy, don't let anyone despise your youth, right? You are young, but you are qualified. You are qualified for service. And so serve as such. And then later he does, or um, on other places in Timothy, I think it's in second Timothy, he gives instructions for how a church should function across age groups. So I just want to point that out. I just want to say one last thing before we move on. Something that's been on my heart for the better part of a year now. In our society, I see, I think we all probably recognize a increasingly widening gap between the young and the old. Um, an inability to see eye to eye, to even want to see eye to eye. Um, perhaps this has always been a thing. I've only been alive for probably one generation, so I've only noticed it in mine. But I think the way technology has moved so fast, the way ideas and information move so fast, uh, that gap is widening quickly between the young and the old. And we consider each other, uh, I think young people sometimes consider the old out of touch. I think the old sometimes consider the young foolish, not wise, not experienced enough to understand and speak into certain situations. I think one of the ways that the church can set itself apart and show itself as sanctified in our culture is to have healthy relationships between young and old people, that we have a love for each other, even if sometimes, you know, sometimes it might be true. I'm not trying to speak, speak down, but sometimes old people can be out of touch, if I can say that, right? <laughs> it can happen, right? Young people are, are often out there living in the workplaces and the schools and things, and they see what's going on in that culture. And they, they may see things that somebody who has been retired for a while or, or stays home more often than not might not see. I mean, I'm not trying to be critical. I'm just making the point we have to be humble. Young people, we can definitely be foolish in an experience, right? We can see something that the world offers and get excited about it and not see how dangerous it might be, not see how, how much of a hindrance it might be. Um, and so we should not despise either of those things. We should recognize that in love, we need to come together with our collective experiences, our collective energies and enthusiasms and work together for the glory of God. And I think that's a way that we can set ourselves apart from the culture because in the culture, it's just despised, it's mocked. And there's a separation here and a hardening and an anger and bitterness that sometimes we see boil over. Um, and I just want to encourage us, love everyone no matter their age and see the value, the importance that you have. So I just wanted to spend some time mentioning that because it's something that troubles me and I see it happening in our world. I see it creeping into the church. I see it happening, actively disrupting some churches that I know of. Um, and it's a terrible thing. We're given instruction. That's not supposed to be the way it is. And I think we can really set ourselves apart from the culture by loving each other and serving regardless and not despising age, youth or old age. Um, the next thing he says to him, he says, no one despise your youth. Be an example to the believers in the way you fellowship, right? In word. Um, think about the way you speak, right? In your words. Timothy, your words have impact. You're going to be the main teacher here. Your words are going to have impact on them. Be an example to them how they should use those words, how they should teach, how they should speak to each other in love, how they should pray, right? All the ways that word speech can be used in fellowship. Be an example, Timothy. I think that's something for us to meditate on. How, how, how are we using our words in fellowship? How are our words serving fellowship? Something that, something that Timothy didn't have, but we have nowadays is the words we post on the internet. How are they serving fellowship? Are they serving fellowship? Are they contributing to a healthy fellowship? Or are they introducing ideas that really have no place in the believer's mind, that, that don't serve the Lord's kingdom, right? How are those words being used? Are the words we're using serving the Lord's kingdom? Are the words we're using building up his people? Um, we need to think about all the ways words are used. And Paul says, Timothy, you be example in those words. I think all of us should strive uh, to use our words as an example to others and how Christians should fellowship so that believer, unbelievers see the words we use with one another see the words we use. Um, and they say, that's, that's, some, that, that, that's, that's somebody who is sanctified. That's a group of people that are truly set apart in this world. So Timothy, be an example in word. Um, he also says to him, be an example in your conduct, your actions. Think about the way, take words out of it. Forget your words. Maybe you think I have good words and you're excusing actions that shouldn't be there because you're, you think your words are hiding those things. But be an example in word and in conduct, the way you act. Um, all the things that you, the way you serve other people in your church, the way you serve other people in the world, the way you conduct yourself in your relationships, whatever they might be, 
B, some, and I, I think we all have to think about our own conduct, the spaces we've been given, whether you're a student, whether you're an employee, whether you're a neighbor, uh, whatever, whether you're a citizen, whatever it might be, what is that conduct? And is it a good example to the believers? Is it good for fellowship? Um, he says to him as well, he says in, in word, in conduct, in love, be a good example in love. That's a high calling. <laughs> That's a tough challenge to be an example in love. What does that look like? Some people will say, I hear it so often, oh, all, all we need is love, right? Love is all you need. What the world needs now is love, sweet love, right? Um, but okay, that's a great idea. But love is like love is a is like an ultimate goal. It truly be loving somebody. And I think so many people stop, don't they jump there and they don't take the time to think about what are those small ways you're showing love, right? How are you doing with those things? How are you doing with your listening? How are you doing with the way you speak to others? How are you doing with your tone, with your attitude, right? All the little indications that represent love. How are you doing with those things? Are you mindful of all of those things? I um, mean, we as believers should be so mindful in the way we show love, especially to each other. Um, um, I can't remember the exact thing, but Christ says to his disciples, they'll, they'll know you are my followers uh, by, oh, I can't think of the exact wording he uses, but they'll know you're my followers basically by the way you treat one another, right? They'll know by, by your love for one another. Um, and we should be so mindful in that. And again, Timothy commanded, be an example in love, in spirit. I'll talk more about this in verse 15, um, but um, the Holy Spirit had been given at this point, right? The church, the Holy Spirit had been given as a symbol uh, to the church. And it's, he's called the gift. Uh, the Holy Spirit was given as the gift. And I think, you know, something that really was pressed in my mind as I studied this scripture, God's work is supernatural. It's truly something greater than human hands. And if we try to serve God's work by our own strength, it is meaningless. How can we serve a supernatural work with our own human strength, our own human hands? So he's to command Timothy, use the gift, use the power of the Holy Spirit. The only way that you can serve my purposes, my supernatural, holy, higher than anything else purposes is through the power of my spirit. That's why I gifted him to you. And so be an example in spirit. Don't be out there trying to do things with your own words. So many people do it. They sound good on the pulpit, right? They sound good. But are they really filled with the spirit? Because if they're not, those words are empty. They're not serving God's purposes. So Timothy, be an example in spirit. Like I said, we'll talk more about that in verse 15, but I wanted to point that out. Um, in faith and in purity. Uh, something I put up there, some other words I, I put in there, but uh, be faithful in your fellowship. Be I think that's one of the most simple ways we can serve. You know, we all want to think about what's my gift? What's this? What's that? Just be faithful. Show up. <laughs> and I, that's not an indictment uh, on right now, obviously, with the pandemic, it's not always possible to come out. And that's not an indictment. That's something that's completely understandable. Uh, but be faithful and showing up to the Zoom service, right? <laughs> Just be faithful. Be consistent. If you're able to come out, come out. If, you're, if you feel healthy and well enough to come out, come out. That's an application for our time. But be consistent. Be faithful. If there's ways you can serve those who can't come out right now, be faithful in that service, showing them love through faithfulness and impurity, truly is showing yourself as someone who is set apart from the things of this world and somebody who is focused on understanding and pursuing the teachings of Christ and what it is that he has called us to do. Um, and so I just think it's important, all these things, I, I would encourage you, go back through verse 12, read all those words to be an example about, and think about them, meditate on them, apply them, question it, challenge yourself. Am I really, how am I doing on these things? Am I really showing love through my speech, through my word, through my conduct? Uh, be mindful of that conduct and fellowship. Um, and then receive joy. Be, be excited to be around other believers. Seek a community, be desire to be a community of people who are all serving as examples in these areas because that's where true joy and fellowship will come from. And it's just a wonderful thing to see God's people, his church operating in that way. I think the world sees that and it truly sets us apart. Verse 13, till I come, give attention to these things. This is probably the most important verse to me in this whole section, this short little verse 13. And I've just spent so much time thinking about this. Um, give attention, give special attention to these things. Um, and I think we can pass over that. Um, in verse, I'll jumping ahead of myself, but in verse 15, Paul tells Timothy, give yourself entirely. In, in, in 2 Timothy chapter two, he'll say, he'll say, remember the things that you are fully persuaded of. And those are heavy words. I, I would, again, I don't have time to speak on these things. There's things for you to go back and meditate on if you're jotting these things down. But Think on the word attention. Think on the word give attention. Think on the word give yourself entirely. And think on the words fully assured. And say, am I somebody who is these three things, right? Am I truly giving attention to the things of the Lord? 
am I truly giving myself entirely to them? Or am I giving myself 90%, but 5% to the other things that I'm interested in and 5% to something else separate from it? Um, I'm not sitting up here telling you that I've mastered 100% at all. <laughs> Even Paul himself says, I mentioned Philippians 3, I haven't attained it. I press on, right? It's something, it's a challenge that we strive for, to give ourselves entirely to the things of the Lord, uh, to give special attention to those things, to be, and what, I think when we do those things, that's how we become more and more fully persuaded um, of who the God, Christ is who he said he was, and that he did what he said he did, and that he will do what he said he will do. And we will be where he said we will be one day. Um, and so Paul says here, give intention to these things. Here's the three things, reading, exhortation, and doctrine. So let's start with reading. Um, by way of context, um, there, uh, you're, who, does anybody have a translation that says the public reading? Um, yeah, public reading, okay. So the reason for that is at this time, obviously, they didn't have Bibles like this, right? <laughs> they didn't have the whole word of God contained in a nice, neat little way like we do. Um, at the time, you had scrolls, right? That's how we, that's how we tr track the scriptures is through scrolls, the Dead Sea Scrolls and things like that that we have found. That's how they read. Not everybody could have the scriptures in their home. Many people perhaps couldn't even read the scriptures. Um, you had different, you had people in, this, in these churches, in these cultures who were slaves, were not educated. There's all different kinds of things, right? So what did they do? How did they study the word? They came together and there was public reading of the scripture. So Timothy as the leader would have been his job to read from the scriptures, to read the word of God. That's how they heard the word of God. That's how they spent time in the word of God. In fact, in the book of Acts, you can see throughout the week, they would, they would sometimes gather together in one place. They'd be at, they'd, and it, they would be at the temple on Sundays talking with people there. And then it, it, it indicates that other days they were in homes. They would go home to home every single day of the week. And they'd be there reading the scriptures and praying together. Uh, because that's how people got the word of God. That's how they were read from the word. That's how they studied it. When the Bereans, we'll talk about them later, when the Bereans came together to look at the words, study the scriptures, and compare the words of the apostles to what was in the scriptures, they came together. That's what they did. And they opened those scrolls. They looked at these things together. They opened whatever scroll, book, however it was, they read it together. And so when he tells Timothy here, give attention to the reading, the public reading, he's basically saying, be in the word. Lead your people in the word. Make sure that's the first, and I think that's the most important thing. It's good to hear messages. Um, it's, good, it's good to study books that teach on doctrine. But, if, but those things are meaningless if you don't have the word of God to compare them to. Um, the word of God is it's, it's the most powerful thing. Uh, Paul will tell Timothy later on that all scripture is given by inspiration of God, meaning it's God-breathed. God is speaking to you. It is active. It is powerful, more powerful than any two-edged sword the scripture says too, right? Um, this is where lives are changed, is in the reading of this word. Uh, you know, as I, as I try to, I, 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 perhaps I'm wrong, only the Lord knows, but I have never felt particularly gifted as, at evangelism. Uh, but in this past year at the pandemic, there's many people I know, I meet around the city of Detroit, who are just looking for answers. And I've been wrestling with how do I best explain to them what I believe. And I've just become more and more convicted. I need them to read this word, right? That's what's powerful. That's what changes hearts. The spirit, uh, the working of the Holy Spirit, the power of God's word is what changes people. It's what changes us. It's what changes us at one point. When we came to know the Lord, it was not apart from the word of God. It is what will continue to change us, is the reading of this word. It is the most powerful thing out there. Uh, it's, it's from it, we should learn all things from this scriptures. Um, and so I think it's the most, I think it's the first thing he gives to him before he even talks about, uh, before he even talks about the next two things, which are exhortation and doctrine, which are direct outputs of the word or should be, he says, give attention to reading first and foremost. So I think there's a reason that it comes first, because all exhortation that we hear should be compared to the reading of the word. That's our standard for truth. Somebody mentioned it. I think, Rob, you mentioned it with the what is truth thing. Christ wasn't just the perfect expert on truth. He was the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through him. No one can understand God, the Father. No one can understand Christ. No one can understand what the way and the truth is if we're not in his word. So all exhortation we hear should be compared to the reading of the word. All doctrine we receive should be compared to the reading of the word. Those two things that come next. And I, I want to make that example again. Remember the Bereans, right? Uh, we all know them. They're, they're famous because, because what, what do they do? They search the scriptures. And the context there, if you read through Acts, is what was happening is when, when the apostles were in, were in Jerusalem, they were performing miracles. Uh, and I think one of the reasons for that is for the Jews, who they were ministering to in Jerusalem, their standard for a prophet was that miracle was, was miracles and that things would come to pass. So for the Jews, they needed to perform these signs and wonders so the Jews could validate them as prophets and validate them as messengers of God. When they go to Samaria, they perform more miracles. 
right? Uh, why? Well, why do the Samaritans believe in Jesus the first time he came around? They saw his miracles, right? And the Samaritans saw those same miracles from people claiming to be followers of Christ, and they realized these people are truly messengers of Christ. But they come to the Bereans, and it says they were more fair-minded. They thought differently is the idea. And so when they hear, when they hear these people claiming to be messengers of Christ, they say, well, what does the scripture say? Is what you're telling me about the Christ aligned with what the scriptures say? And so the, the, actually, and Timothy is there, by the way. Timothy at this point has been picked up by Paul. So when Timothy, when they're in Berea preaching, everything Timothy says is being studied. They're looking at the words, looking at the reading of the scriptures. They're coming together. They're reading those scriptures, and they're saying, is what the apostles are teaching truly about the Christ? And it was, and they believed because of that. And so Paul says to Timothy, and Timothy saw this in the example of the Bereans, he says, give a special attention to reading. I spent a lot of time on that point because I just can't stress it to you enough. <laughs> um, uh, I, uh, Rob encouraged me when I started with BSS to take time out of my day just to be in the word. And I'm in the word a lot. These last five months, I've been in the word more than any other point in my life. And the things that the Lord has been showing me and teaching me just by sitting and reading his word and taking time to think about it has done so much for me. It really has. I, I can't express it. It's the working of the spirit. Uh, but I encourage you, be in the word and give attention to it. Give attention to exhortation, Timothy. So out of the reading of your word, what are you sharing? How are you challenging? How are you encouraging people? Share what you're learning from where with, with others. We think of exhortation as just what I'm doing right now. That's not, that's, not, that's not all that it is. In fact, it's probably just a fraction of what it really is. It's when you guys come together, when you meet one-on-one, -on -one, right? When you talk to your spouse at night, are you encouraging one another with the words that you've been reading in scripture that day? Are you manifesting those things through your actions? Are, are, are what you're reading in the scriptures revealing itself in the way you handle the relationships, whether it be a spouse, whether it be a friend, whether it be a neighbor, whatever it is? How are we encouraging one another through what we're reading in the word? Give attention to what you are sharing, what you are living out based on the reading of the word. And then give attention to doctrine. Doctrine is what you believe based on what you've read. What have I decided to believe based on what I'm reading? Um, if you're reading things apart from the scripture, you're probably going to eventually end up believing things that aren't scripturally sound. That's what was happening. People were reading other things. They were hearing other things. Things had crept in in chapter one or verse four. They're giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrine of demons because they're not in the word. Their doctrines have become doctrines of demons, not doctrines of Christ, not doctrines of God. And so how do we avoid that? The reading of the word, good exhortation will result in good doctrine. Timothy, give very special attention to the doctrine that you are giving to them because they're being deceived by all kinds of doctrine. Everybody believes in doctrine of some sort. Everybody believes something about something. Um, is it guided by the scriptures? Our doctrine must be guided by the scriptures. So Timothy, give attention to these things to be a good minister of the gospel to these people. Then in verse 14, do not neglect the gift that is in you. Um, I've read some commentaries that seem to think he's talking about specific spiritual gifts, but my understanding here and from other things I read, he's simply talking about the Holy Spirit, the gift, right? When Christ talks about the Holy Spirit, he refers to him as the gift or the helper. Um, and so I think here what he's saying is um, do not neglect the Holy Spirit. It goes back to that idea I talked about when he says to Timothy to be an example in spirit. Again, the Lord's work is a supernatural one, the changing of lives, right? One of my favorite verses, 2 Corinthians 5. This is, this is what Christ does for us, right? He was in the world reconciling all things back to himself. And anybody who is in Christ is a what? A new creation. Anyone, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old things have passed away. Some of the last words of Christ in the Bible, I know what they are in Revelation, behold, I what? I make all things new. That's what the Lord does to make people new. By the way, he makes things new for eternity, which think on that. It's a paradox, right? <laughs> How can something be around forever and still be new? I make all things new for all eternity. I mean, that's an that's a incredible work that none of us can ever accomplish by our own power. We can't make things new. If I made something brand new right now, tomorrow, it would be old, right? It would fall apart. That's, not, that's the way the world works. My hands can, I can make things but they become old immediately. Christ makes something new for all eternity. That's the work he has done. And that's what we're called to. We are called, and right, he says that, that the Lord, the Christ was here doing the work of reconciliation. And what did he do with that? He has now entrusted that work to us. We have now been given the word of reconciliation. That's why Paul says, if we are, if we are, um, we are, if we are in our minds, it is, if we are out of our minds, it is for you. If we are in our minds, it is for Christ. We want to give ourselves completely to this work of reconciliation. That's what the Lord does. And so we must serve it by that gifting, the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is an important part of our calling as new creations. If we try to serve the Lord's work apart from the power of his spirit, apart from the working of his Holy Spirit, 
is empty. It is meaningless. And just that's been impressed on my heart the last couple of weeks as I thought on this passage that how am I serving? You know, maybe I speak kindly. Maybe I speak kindly to my unsafe friends. Um, so they don't, you know, so they, so I reflect Christ well with them. But am I truly speaking to them with the Holy Spirit, right? And when I, when I, when I show kindness, when I show love, when I, when I say things to them, am I just doing it out of the goodness of my human heart? Or am I truly desiring to see their lives changed by the power and the working of the Holy Spirit? Right. When I when I teach from the scriptures, am I just sharing from my own head knowledge, or have I prayed and meditated and poured over these things and asked the Spirit to use the words of the scripture, to use God's word to speak to his children, to speak to his creations? And so we must serve the Lord. We must serve his purposes through the power of his Holy Spirit. That's why he gave it to us. Timothy, don't neglect the gift that was given to you. So as you serve in reading, exhortation, and doctrine, as you do those things, don't neglect the Holy Spirit that was given to you, right? It's an important part of this. You cannot, if you're doing doctrine, sorry, if you're doing reading, exhortation, and doctrine, but neglecting the gift of the Spirit, that's empty. Do those three things without neglecting, by using, taking full advantage of the power of the Holy Spirit. It's an important part of our calling as a new creation. The power of the Spirit comes when we're reading His Word, when we're speaking His words to one another. Um, I think our fellowship should be so full of the of scriptures and the ideas of scripture. I'm not saying that's all we have to talk about, but it should be directing our perspectives. It should be a part of our fellowship together and then living out the word. It's a part of our actions. Um, spend time with people who are active in the word of God because you'll see the spirit working through their actions as well. And that's what a fellowship should be. That's what the early church was, is uh, people who were filled with the Holy Spirit coming together to grow closer to the Lord. Use it to glorify God and build up his body. That's just an important thing, right? Um, the main part, what's the Holy Spirit's job? It's to glorify the Son and the Father, right? No glory to the Spirit. Um, it's, to, it's to equip us for the glorification of God. And so everything that we do, a great standard, I could say more about this, but a great standard for somebody's service is, is it bringing glory to God? That's how you know, or, or even my own actions. How do I know my actions are Spirit-filled, that the Spirit is working in me? Is it bringing glory to God? It's a question we should be asking, or am I you trying to use it to bring glory to myself? And maybe I'm using kindness to make people like me better instead of using kindness to point people to Christ. Um, it's just an important thing to keep in mind. We'll begin to wrap up here now by looking at verse 15. I think this is a huge concept for me because he talks about, right? He says, be an example. Be an example in all these different areas. Give attention to reading and exhortation and doctrine. Don't neglect your gift. Now meditate on those things. I think he says, meditate on these things, then give yourself entirely to them. But I think there's an important progression we have to think about here. Do not give yourself entirely to anything until you've taken the time to meditate on it right? Think on these things. If anything is good, if anything is noble, if anything is a good report of virtue, right? We know this verse. I think it's in Ephesians. If, any, if, if anything is any one of those things, meditate on it. Think on those things. And so look at, search the scriptures, receive doctrine, right? Uh, uh, give exhortation, but meditate on it and then give yourself fully to it. I think it's an important step. Meditation is a key step here. I think the word meditation has maybe developed somewhat of a connotation that we don't like in our culture because you know we had decades of people even now people use the word meditate for i think unholy practices unholy purposes but meditation is still a really good thing it's just what are you filling your mind with when you practice meditation and is it a meditation of of god um you know if it, in modern meditation at least in the west it would be meditation would be to empty your mind just to clear your mind um that's fine but it's only half the battle right it's only half of the purpose of, Christ, of what christ calls us to do Meditation is to clear your mind of all this world's distractions so you can focus entirely on the things of God. So you can fill your mind with the word you have been reading. You can fill your mind with exhortations you've been giving and receiving. And you can fill your mind with doctrines you should be believing based on those other things. Um, and so he gives the commandment here, meditate on these things. Meditation was no joke to Christ, right? <laughs> it, when Christ is going to be tempted, what did he do? It's in the beginning of, I think it's in the beginning of Matthew, the temptation in the wilderness. Where was he? He was in the wilderness fasting for 40 days and 40 nights so he could battle the temptation of the devil. That's no joke. <laughs> That's serious. I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not encouraging you to go out in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights, right? If you do tell somebody before you go um, and be careful, make sure you can survive in those elements. But that's what Christ did. He got away from distractions. There's other places, if you read through the Gospels, there's other places where it's, it, he gets overwhelmed by the crowds. He gets overwhelmed by the distractions and he gets in a boat and he floats away to the other shore or out in the middle of the water. He removed himself from those distractions. The Garden of Gethsemane, right? He left the upper room and he went out into the garden to pray, to be before his father, to give himself that space so he could meditate and pray 
on these things, to clear his mind of all earthly distractions and focus on the things of his father. And so I think we need to be active about meditation. If you just read the scriptures and don't think about the words, they're, they're not going to have their full impact on you. But I, 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 would, I would validate, I would, I would present to you that if you are reading the scriptures, you will, you will meditate on them. Um, so I'm not saying you have to be, you have to force yourself to do these things. I would say, just start in the word, <laughs> just read the word and the spirit will give you ideas and you will say, I need to think more about those things. So again, it just all starts with being in the word. Um, it's a key decision. It's a key step in making decisions about what you choose to believe. Right. Um, and then there's that idea. Does this thing I am giving myself entirely to indicate progress toward Christ likeness? That's exactly what Paul says to Timothy. Meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them that your progress may be evident to all. He wraps up that idea. Don't let anyone despise your youth. Let your progress be evident to all. How does that happen? All the things that come in between, right? Being an example in fellowship, giving attention to reading, exhortation, and doctrine, using the power of the Holy Spirit, meditating, giving yourself entirely, and your progress may be evident to all. We know what Christ like we know what Christ likeness looks like because we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Um, I made it a practice just the last three years. I read John once a year. I just read the book of John. John was the disciple that spent, it, it seems he spent the most time close to Jesus. And what's, the things that John saw, the things he recorded are incredible. Just to see the way Jesus did things. Jesus, one of my favorite things is when Jesus touches a leper, right? Nobody would do that. No one touched, he could have just said, you're healed. But what did he do? He touched the leper. And that's just one little tiny thing. The book of John is filled with things that show us what Christ was really like. Another great place to understand Christ's likeness, book of Philippians. Let this what be in you. Let this mind be in you. That was also in Christ Jesus. The indication there is we can understand the mind. That's, that's a crazy calling. Have the same mind as Jesus Christ, right? Like what? <laughs> How can I do that? I'm a, human, I'm a human being. We're called to do that. We're called to have it. Let this mind be in you. The, right before he says that, you know what he says right before he says, let, let, let this mind be in you? He says, let nobody esteem himself better than others right? Treat each other. Treat others as better than yourself. Let this mind be in you. Also in Christ Jesus, right? Who didn't, the idea is he didn't consider, he didn't consider staying in heaven worth not coming to get us, is the idea, is an expression he uses there. In other words, Christ decided heaven wasn't good enough without us there. He wanted his creation restored, reconciled back to him, praising him for all eternity. That's the mind of Christ. So give yourself entire, understand what Christ likeness looks like, Give yourself fully to those things. How do you understand it? Again, you're in the word. You're receiving good doctrine, good teaching. You're, you're spending time in fellowship. Meditate on those things the Lord is showing you through all of that. Give yourself entirely to that. Your progress may be evident to all. That those, your brothers and sisters in Christ see it and they understand, they're encouraged, they grow by it. The unsaved people in your life see that progress. See that you are trending towards something so far apart from the things of this world right? You are trending towards something much different than what everybody else is pursuing because you're pursuing the things of Christ. Your progress may be evident to all. We're almost out of time, so I'll just wrap up here. Take heed to self and doctrine. Um, it, he's basically reiterating everything that was said. Take heed. Think about these things. Are these things that I just laid out for you in these first four verses, are they evident in your life? Give heed to those things. Give heed to the doctrine you're teaching. Does the doctrine you're teaching reflect the things of Christ, things of God? Um, do those things and doing these, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. And the idea, of course, is not salvation by action. It's that if you are presenting the things of God, the things of Christ to others, that's where salvation comes from. And that should be what we're about as Christians. That's, that should be what we're about as believers is desiring to see salvation. Desiring to see salvation worked out in the lives of our brothers and sisters. And desiring to see salvation come about in the life of somebody who does not know them. And these are the ways that we serve the Lord through those things. Let's go ahead and close in prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, even in just such a short little span of, 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 of passage here, Lord, there's just so many ideas to fill ourselves with. Lord, clear our minds today, tomorrow. Clear our minds. Help us to say, as you commanded, Lord, in your, in your prayer, give us today our daily bread. Uh, teach us to not worry about tomorrow, but to give ourselves to the things of today and to fill our mind, to, to clear those worries of tomorrow out and to fill our mind with these things here, to meditate on them, to think about them, um, to, to, to see your power at work. Uh, and to, to pray over that power and desire to see it lived out in the lives of our brothers and sisters and the lives of our neighbors and the lives of our, our countrymen and our those other citizens of the whole world, Lord. Just to, to teach us the desire to see your salvation brought about in mighty ways. Uh, so we thank you for this passage that gives us so much insight uh, into how we can be serving others, Lord, and ultimately, Lord, to be serving your kingdom. Um, Lord, we just 
thank you for the salvation that makes it possible. Lord, we just say thank you so much for your son that not only died for us, but rose for us. And not only rose for us, but lives for us and sits at the right hand, your right hand, as an example that, uh, uh, that the work is completed and that we have a hope that is eternal, that we will be new for all eternity, Lord. So we just thank you so much that truly because he lives, we can face tomorrow. We can go out and know that the, 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 the time that we spend serving him is not time that is wasted. Um, and so, Lord, teach us to be about that time, that kind of time, working towards using our time in those ways. So we just ask all these things, Lord. We give your name all the praise and glory that it deserves. In your name, amen.